Well, good evening and welcome to the First Amendment Center, part of the Siegenthaler series tonight. And uh, that's a series of conversations with media figures, influential players in society, largely about democracy and the media and the path of the, of the country ahead. Uh, it honors the legacy of John Siegenthaler. And if you knew John and came to events here, you know that the hallmark of John's events were big name, successful people who had changed the path of history in many cases and then always accompanied by refreshments and a reception in which you could really engage in the marketplace of ideas. So what we're doing with the series is to replicate, do it exactly as John would have done it. And so we're delighted you're here. And we have a very special guest tonight. Um, she's a woman I've known in, in some ways, we've grown up together in the, in the newspaper industry. Um, we both run news operations in New York and then went on to jobs that were a little bit more high profile. Uh, she was the editor of the Buffalo News and, and worked her way up in that newsroom and then walked into, I think, one of the toughest jobs in American journalism, being the public editor at the New York Times. Everyone has an opinion about the New York Times and they all want to share it with, with the public editor. Uh, and, and then from that job, she went in to become the media columnist for the Washington Post at, again, maybe the most interesting time in history. Uh, uh, in, involving media and, the, and Washington and the destiny of this country. So please welcome Margaret Sullivan. Thank you. I am so glad to have you here. I, you know, um, when you went from the day-to-day -day grind of a daily newsroom into, into the New York Times, I was, I was worried about you. <laughs> you know, I, I thought, I may never see Margaret again. <laughs> And you thrived, and I, I'm just so proud of, of what you've accomplished. Uh, you did more with the public editor's job than I think your predecessors may have. That's not a criticism, but you really embraced the job. Why, why did that job appeal to you so much? You know, I had thought uh, for a long time when I was in Buffalo for many years, starting as a summer intern and becoming the first woman to edit the paper, uh, that if I were to make a move to a big market that I, you know, two things I could see myself doing were uh, to be the public editor of the Times or the ombudsman or ombudswoman of the Washington Post, which is a job that no longer exists. Um, and I just thought that because I had a, a long and pretty varied career uh, doing different things in newspapers that uh, it would be a natural. And it, it actually did turn out to be, and I had many people tell me when I was doing that job that it seemed like I was born to do it. And uh, I, I, I felt that way, but at the same time, it was often really difficult and very stressful. There's an inherent tension in it because you're kind of like internal affairs uh, or the inspector general. You know, you're, you are holding people accountable who you work with. And that, and I went to the Times office every day and sat in the newsroom. And so, it's, were it's, you really popular there? Yeah. Did everyone like Margaret? Uh, they acted. They wanted me to think so. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, there there were some very tense moments. I can tell you that. I was also I happened to be there uh, at the time when Jill Abramson, the first woman editor of the New York Times, was fired. And so that was a very interesting time to be to be there. And you know, when I first came to the Times, I thought, wow, this is incredible. I'm coming in, and Jill Abramson is the editor, and, and this is a historic uh, moment at the Times, and it was. And I didn't know just how historic it was going to be because she was fired. Yeah. The, the process of coming in, and the New York Times is a great newspaper. Um, I was the editor of USA Today for a number of years, and, and all those years denied that, that the New York Times was a great newspaper. I was, wasn't colorful at all. Um, but, you know, once I'm out of that, that it, it's my go-to newspaper. I think it's extraordinary. You have a lot of reporters at the New York Times who are very, very good. Yes. And just believe, ask them. And, yeah, exactly. <laughs> just ask them. And, and they believe they're very, very, very good. Yes. And, and what is it like to kind of have to take them down a notch and say, you know what, you, you're, not in, you're not perfect and, mm -hmm. and you've let the public down with this? So, you know, my process for doing that was to represent the reader. And that gave me, uh, it wasn't as if I were making these judgments strictly on my own. Uh, issues would arise that would be controversial. And I would take them from the readers who would come to me with them. 
and take them normally to the editors. So it wasn't as if I was walking down the hall and saying, hey, you know, Joe reporter, you got this wrong. I think so. It, there, there's a little more cover than that in it. One is that you represent the reader, and the other is that you go to the boss. Right. And that, that helps. But certainly there are in every newsroom, as you know, big, big egos. <laughs> and the times might be the biggest of all. Absolutely. So it's tough. And you know, many times I'd get a lot of pushback, and it would be highly uncomfortable. There would be times when I would come into the building after writing a tough column and think, uh, I, I just don't want to be here. Yeah. It was hard. So I'm, I'm curious, during your tenure there, what was the biggest screw up on your watch? The biggest screw up at, of the times. Of the times, well, yeah, <laughs> not, not mine. Not your personal screw yeah. up. But you can share that as well if you'd like. <laughs> Nothing there was. <laughs> now, what, what, where did the newspaper air the most that you had to take the courageous stand and say, you know? Yeah, well, there, there was a. There was a tough uh, couple of stories, um, and they, it was fairly late in my in my tenure, that were based on anonymous sources, and they turned out. You know, one of them is a sort of a famous. <laughs> it's become kind of famous. Uh, the Times reported on its front page that Hillary Clinton was the object of a criminal investigation. And uh, it was based on an anonymous, you know, Justice Department source. And well, it turned out that yes, she. This was during the campaign. Uh, she was, in fact, the target of, or uh, had been not the target, but had been identified as as uh, her situation, not her, but her 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 email practices had been uh, were becoming the subject of a national security investigation. That's different than, Hillary, in a headline, Hillary Clinton being the subject of a criminal investigation. And the source was wrong. I had a deputy managing editor say, we got the story wrong because our source got it wrong. <laughs> and that, unfortunately, <laughs> rang a little too familiar at the times because of the reporting that happened in the in the run up to the Iraq war when the times sources got it wrong about the weapons of mass destruction and therefore the times got it wrong so the readers did not want to hear that right. and and that was that was tough uh, and there was another s story that was sourced similarly and it was you know these were big important lead stories in the paper well that takes us to anonymous sources and um and, and leaks, but, but on the subject of anonymous sources, the challenge is some of the biggest stories come from people who don't want to be identified. Absolutely. But unless you know who they are, you can't, it's hard to attach credibility. What's the proper balance? Well, you can't do journalism without confidential sources. Well, you can do it, but it will look a lot like public relations. Um, so you have, to, you have to be willing to work your sources and give them some cover. And some of the biggest and most important stories as you know, uh, have been done that way. But when you do it too much and you do it gratuitously, you eat away at the trust that your readers need to have in you. And so when, you know, the Times has a rule that says anonymous sources or the cover of anonymity can, will only be given as a last resort. And then you would pick up the paper or look through the website, and every story would be sourced anonymously. And you'd say, wow, that's a lot of last resorts today, and it'll be the same tomorrow. Um, so, you know, I would say sparingly is one answer to try to give as much, uh, to try to give the reader as much information as we can about who these sources are, even if we can't say their name, can we say something beyond a US official? Give some specificity and give some explanation. So I think those two things go a long way. When you have the job you have, you know, basically being public editor says you're the representative of the public. So did you answer your own phone? As public editor? Yes. Uh, well, interestingly, by the time I got there, the, the contact from um, the readers was coming largely through email. And a lot of it, it would be 500 emails a week. 
I had an assistant, which was an absolute necessity. And that person who was, you know, at the times you get these assistants who, you know, they could actually run the world. You know, they're, they're, they're so good. Um, and they would do sort of the triage and say, mm, here's something you ought to deal with. But of course I did pick up my phone and sometimes at the other end of the phone line would be someone inside the building <laughs> who, who wanted to tell me about something they thought should be investigated. Wow. So, wow. so, you know, then I had to give them some cover. I asked the question just because, as you know from years in the Buffalo News, uh, the people who pay your salary then 35 cents at a time yes. have great ownership of the newspaper. That's and right. I, 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 there have been times when I've had to set aside when I've been editor, I say, I will call back people between four and five. Absolutely. But if all day long I'm taking those calls, I'm, you know, you don't get anything done. No, that's and true. I, your job is just mind boggling to me. Um, so given that the fact that the New York Times is perceived as being liberal, and it is probably liberal on the editorial page, my view is that it's just smart in the rest of the paper. Mm -hmm. But um, were most of the complaints from liberals who felt the New York Times was letting them down, or conservatives who thought, you're just in the wrong place. I think that uh, actually probably liberals who thought that the paper wasn't either not liberal enough or not doing it the way I think it should be done. One of the big subjects that uh, was insoluble was the Middle East. And so there you'd be hearing a lot from sort of the pro-Israel sort of Zionist uh, folks who you know, really felt that the Times was against them because it gave voice to Palestinian people and Palestinian suffering. And then you'd get sort of civil libertarians and, and other liberals of other stripes who thought that the Times was in the pocket of Israel. So you really, that was a very, very touchy and difficult subject. And I tried not to write about it too much, but I did write one Finally, I felt like I had to do a Middle East column, and the first line of it was, this is the column I never wanted to write. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, you, you know, by all accounts, you did a great job. You managed not to irritate the New York Times very much, and you, and, and you found this great kind of middle ground, being the voice of authority and accountability. You could have stayed there longer. I believe they would have signed you up for a longer oh, they, term. They did ask me to stay longer. And, um, and you walked away. Why would you walk away from this high visibility job that's so much fun? <laughs> well, and it was fun in many ways. Um, I just was, you know, I was aware that I, of my own age, <laughs> that I was in my 50s, well into my 50s, and that I didn't want to end my career as public editor of the New York Times. And so I, if I were going to do something, I'd better go do it. And uh, also, I felt like it's so useful to be kind of an outsider in that job. And yet, if you come to work in a place every day, you're no longer an outsider. So by the time year three had come around, I felt like, well, these are my colleagues, and I work here, and hey, I'm, I belong to the New York Times. You know, you start to feel kind of that thing of, oh, I must be pretty great, because I'm here. <laughs> um, and then it's time to go. Yeah. So. Um, I was very flattered to be asked and, and gratified, but I think I did the right thing in leaving. And I had the opportunity to, to go to the Washington Post, where one of the people I've admired most in journalism, Marty Baron, was the editor. And if those of you who've seen the Spotlight movie know that Marty was played by Lee Schreiber, and he was the then editor of the Boston Globe when they did the priest scandal investigation. Um, Little did I know, however, <laughs> that I'd be coming to the Post, the Washington Post, at a time when life would be pretty exciting in Washington. Well, and, and that's a perfect segue. Um, I, was, I went back and read everything you've written since the day you walked into the Washington Post, and I was struck by how Donald Trump is pretty much a weekly subject for you. And I cannot think of another time in American history where the incoming president would be mentioned in every column yeah. by a media writer. I mean, never. No, and, it's and, very strange. And, and, and yet it's week after week after week, and all new angles, mm -hmm. all new insults, all new targets. It's kind of the only story in some ways. And, and, yet, and, and yet it's been the only story since the primaries began. That's right. 
which is criticism of the news media. Mm -hmm. So let's start with that. I'm, yeah. I'm curious as, you know, um, there were other Republican candidates for president who said Trump took all the oxygen out of the air, they couldn't get any attention. There are people today who were fervent Hillary Clinton supporters who believe that the media gave so much coverage to Trump that it was the equivalent of handing him the presidency. Uh, what was your take on all of that? Well, I think during the primary, Donald Trump got a lot of help from the cable news networks, uh, particularly, well, certainly Fox to some extent, but certainly CNN. CNN would do this thing where, you know, I mean, Donald Trump drives ratings. He He's highly telegenic and he's interesting to watch on TV. And so when he would be on CNN, it would be good for ratings. So CNN would sometimes just you know, train its camera on the empty podium waiting for him to start his rally or something. <laughs> I mean, you can't buy that. Huh. And uh, so I do think he got a lot of help at that point. I think once the conventions came and went, you know, things changed a little bit. But certainly in the primary, I think that the, I think the media, and if we're talking about the media being cable TV, which we often are, um, I think they helped a lot. I do, though, think that uh, many, you know, certainly the, the, the Post, the New York Times, USA Today, and CNN later did do a good job of telling the American public, you know, who the, who the candidates were. Hillary Clinton was more familiar to everyone. She'd been around. Uh, Trump, not so much as a, as a public not in public office, certainly, as a celebrity, yes, as a businessman, yes. But I think that we did tell people, we did investigate, we did scrub his background. We, you know, the Post wrote a book uh, during the campaign about Trump. So, you know, I think it was there, but uh, a lot of people you know, a, lo a lot of people just were looking to, for an alternative to Hillary Clinton. One of the things that struck me in looking at all your coverage, and I, I know you don't write the headlines, I've had enough experience to mm -hmm. understand that, but um, you know, a lot of times when journalists write columns that are critical of a public figure, the, um, the headline will be discreet. So it'll be mayor's decision raises questions. Uh, and it's kind of neutral, signals so there's a controversy brewing, but it's all very civilized. I wanna, here's the headline from a column of yours. Pro-Trump media sets the agenda with lies. Here's how we can take it back. Very understated headline. <laughs> uh, and you quoted Derek Thompson of The Atlantic saying that there's a conspiracy theory feedback loop. Mm -hmm. This is new stuff. What's going on? You mean, why are we allowed to say those things? No, no, no. Or, why, or why? Uh, why are we now writing about a conspiracy theory feedback loop that didn't exist before? Yeah. What's going on in the world that is different, that is actually forcing the Washington Post to be more straightforward, more aggressive, less polite? Right. So a couple things. One is uh, I write a column, and so it's an opinion column, and I get to express my opinion. And happily, the Post has started labeling things much better and that's good. As soon as that started happening, that it labels my column perspective, I stopped hearing from people who were saying, this is a slanted news story. And I'd have to write back to them and say, it's not a news story. Um, so that's been helpful. We also have um, digital um, headline writing experts in the office who write headlines that are pretty out there. Um, and this was one. I, I actually ended up feeling like that headline went too far and I was uncomfortable with it. So, um, but is there, is there a conspiracy theory feedback loop? Yeah, there is, because there's a whole new crop of media organizations out there. I don't know whether I want to call them journalism organizations or not, but that are so... Uh, untethered to the facts that if someone starts something, for example, uh, three million uh, illegal immigrants voted, uh, 
those that'll be picked up. Uh, it can be picked up by the president. It, it will then be amplified uh, by perhaps Breitbart and sort of it comes back and forth. And what, you know, it's been studied now that for a lot of, a lot of people who are in that sort of pretty far right media corridor, they're not hearing, they're not really spreading out to see what the other half is saying. Uh, whereas if you are, you know, if you're reading the Des Moines Register and maybe USA Today and maybe listening to NPR, you're going to get sort of a variety of opinions. If you're over here with Breitbart and Gateway Pundit, you're getting these things which are really distortions and not much else. I want to ask this question respectfully of about Fox News. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we our, our tradition is journalism monastery. Um, and I've said this so many times in public settings, but if you work in a newsroom in America, most newsrooms, most community newsrooms, you don't dream of, of and no one would ever say, let's get this guy. That doesn't come out of anybody's mouth. Um, and I've, I know I've got some journalists in the room. It, 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 first of all, it's a selfish profession. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and nobody would believe that a, a reporter at the Washington Post and the New York Times who had the goods on Barack Obama, who could break a major scandal about Barack Obama, would bury that story because he happened to vote for him earlier. There's no way. Is going to run over him with a truck and the back up and run over him again, because journalism is about the big score. You move up to a big paper. That's just it's nonsense. But I will tell you also the newsrooms are idealistic. They are conscientious about balance. And if somebody started saying things were overtly partisan, they would get hammered by their colleagues. So now we have this phenomenon, largely Fox News, but also MSNBC to some extent where partisanship is marketable. And I'm curious about this. I've met Fox News reporters. Do you believe they believe they're being fair? I feel as though Fox and to some extent CNN too uh, are, but certainly Fox, it's like they're two organizations. There are people there who are really solid journalists, uh, you know, a Chris Wallace, um, and then there's a Sean Hannity. I mean, yes, they're both on Fox News, but they're really not the same kind of um, media personality. I, I, you know, Hannity himself says he's not a journalist, right. but and it shows, by the way, it does. <laughs> um, and then there are people in between. Um, you know, I've I've been interested to see, um, you know, how, for example, Fox is covering things that involve him. This is always very hard to report on yourself. But how did Fox News cover, you know, the Roger Ailes question? And, you know, when Ailes, who's the head of Fox News, was you know, basically being, had to leave uh, his very high perch because of sexual harassment claims. You know, how did they cover that? Eh, pretty lightly, you know? Um, so I think that y you, can't, you can't paint with too broad a brush with Fox. There are good people there. They do journalism. Uh, and at the same time, they're certainly coming from a very, very clear point of view. And it's a point of view that has changed the whole media ecosystem. I want to talk about the art of the tweet. This is brand new, where the President of the United States can, can issue a statement on Twitter. And what's unique about it is it's spontaneous, it's got global reach, and nobody can ask a follow-up question. That's right. No one can challenge it. It's just there. They can challenge it later in their own tweets, but that's a different weapon. And, and I, I will give Trump credit for recognizing the merits of that. No one can challenge you when you're sharing your opinion spontaneously at th 3 o'clock in the morning, um, and then you're, you're being retweeted by your followers. So if you're a professional journalist, is a tweet real? Is it, is it 
equivalent to a, remar uh, a public statement by the President of the United States? Is it, is it to be taken less seriously because it's three in the morning and clearly it's bored? What, what is going on? I mean, you have to take them seriously. You, you, you don't have to take them all uh, at the same level of seriousness. I mean, I remember when, uh, I think it was after the election, but be before the inauguration, when there was this whole little flap about uh, the Mike Pence going to the musical Hamilton, and there was this whole sort of thing, and you know, Donald Trump was complaining that people had booed Pence at Hamilton. I mean, that whole thing was just kind of silly, and yet stories were generated about it and all of that. Now that he's president and is, um, for example, saying that Barack Obama wiretapped him, um, gee, it I, sounds like a story to me. <laughs> I don't know how you can not treat that with great right. seriousness. But you obviously have to take it uh, and look into it as opposed to treat it as a, uh, a statement that is by, by virtue of its existence true. Um, I mean, Trump has done something really amazing, which is that he, as you say, he's eliminated the, the middleman. And presidents have done this in various ways in the past. I mean, a fireside chat was kind of a way to go directly to the people, but not at this level. You wrote a very powerful column in response to the president's statement that the news media are the enemy of the American people. And you wrote that it is a phrase right out of the autocrat's guidebook. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> well, the phrase, the enemy of the, of the people, not the American people, but the enemy of the people, is something that fascist leaders and autocrats have said. And it's, it, it has a history that, that's traceable. It actually is a very resonant phrase. Um, it's hard to believe that that wasn't done with intention, and it's it's scary. Uh, you know, I I I worry that um, I actually do worry about the fate of the democracy right now. Um, it's it you know, people say, well, we have strong institutions. We have the First Amendment. You know, that'll protect us. Well, the First Amendment isn't that. First Amendment is only forty five words. It, it's not that specific. It comes out of uh, it comes out of how we interpret it, how the courts have interpreted it, and how the public is prepared to get behind it. And so, if our credibility is eaten away, is undermined, um, I think we do have something to worry about. And in a in a political system which is veering towards autocracy, the free press is one of the first things to go. So One of the things that I think is very difficult to gauge is uh, I'm old enough to remember when remember when McGovern, McGovern made stumble with Eagleton as his running mate, and that kind of sunk the candidacy of George McGovern, yes, because he didn't have the wisdom to realize that his potential running mate had had some emotional troubles in his past, mental health problems in his past. But that was it. We all the world passed judgment. Throughout history, there have been examples of something happening um, that has have buried a candidate. Having somebody who's not your wife sit on your lap on a boat called monkey business. <laughs> That'll do, do it. That. Um, and yet, and yet, there has been outrage after outrage. You've obviously seen the. We're all familiar with the the tapes about grabbing women and all that. In some way. Did the velocity of outrage keep the press from being as aggressive or as good of watchdogs? I mean, it just, it was like no outrage lingered mm -hmm. because they just kept coming. It was like Cheech and Chong's greatest hits, they just <laughs> kept coming. Well, yeah, I mean, Trump himself said he could walk out into Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and it wouldn't, it wouldn't turn his core away from him. And while I don't think that is true, it did seem as though almost anything could happen and it wouldn't. And, and I think there's a reason for that, which is that people were not focused on that kind of thing. They were focused on their own economic situation. They were focused on feeling left out of the economic resurgence. 
they were focused on not liking Hillary Clinton at all, um, many of them would have gotten behind Bernie Sanders and then felt that that option was taken away from them by the DNC. And it wasn't about, you know, I mean, people were very, Donald Trump's core was very willing to say, it's talk. Yeah. He's just talking. So the press did an okay job in your view. They, they did? No. <laughs> no. <Okay. laughs> no. I think the press missed the overall big story. Uh, they missed the, they, they couldn't have missed it any worse. <laughs> right. They missed the whole idea that Donald Trump could and in fact would become president. It, it just didn't seem to be a possibility. Any idea why the polling was so wrong? You know, the polling was, was, was wrong to some extent. The polls really weren't that bad, but the way the polls were interpreted, and, and I think worse than interpreted, presented. This business of presenting the polls as probability. Um, so you'd go to 538 or the New York Times, and they'd show you, according to our you know, mix of polls, it looks to us as though Hillary Clinton has an 80% chance of winning the presidency. And somehow the normal person looking at that would say, oh, okay, that means she's going to win. But it actually doesn't mean that. If there's a 20 or 30% chance of rain, it would right. be a good idea to take an umbrella. Not that I'm suggesting that, you know, but that's just to look at probability that way. And I think our own sense that Donald Trump would be an inappropriate president <laughs> made us think many of us think that he could, therefore, he couldn't be president. And we weren't connected enough with the red states and the center of the country to know, we had gone in, you know, popped in and like foreign correspondence and done a story and left, but did we really understand? And I think the weakening of local media was part of that too. I'm curious, um, <laughs> and your writing has really toughened since going to the Washington Post? I don't know if it's circumstances or because you're not writing about your colleagues, you can be a little freer. But you wrote a piece after President Trump made his address to Congress, and, and which was widely lauded. Mm. And, and you said that you were disappointed by the fawning. Um, and you said you were disappointed because the press had recently toughened up and develop something resembling a spine over the past few weeks. So that tells us that you thought the press was spineless for a period? I think that they, uh, I think that once, once the election came and went, I saw the press get a lot tougher. Uh, I think before that, because, perhaps because they didn't think that Donald Trump could actually be president. There was an element of, this is kind of really interesting, but maybe we don't have to take it too seriously. And I think that has changed. I will say though, and I mean, it's, it's awkward for me to say this because this is my employer, but I think the Washington Post has done a, a good job, did take his candidacy pretty seriously all along, um, more so than most. Well, let me ask you this. I want to ask you about words. Um, <laughs> I almost share this with you in, 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 embarrassed because when I was at USA Today 2004, 2005, I told the staff that it was a mistake to keep calling us the media. Yeah. That, that, and I saw I essentially said, if you're talking about the news media, say news media. If you're talking about the entertainment media, say entertainment media. Mm -hmm. But there's more than 60,000 individual media outlets in this country. And they have different standards, they have different approaches, and we're falling into a trap by calling it the media. We had an essay contest at Middle Tennessee recently where 14 of my finest students referred to the media in their essay in the singular, mm -hmm. making us feel like complete failures in, our, in the education process. But the media has been a weapon against the media, that phrase. Um, and, and so I want to know your take on, a, on two other words, two other phrases. One is fake news. Mm -hmm. And the other is, should we be calling the Trump plan Trump care? 
I know the Trump administration has said don't do that, but the Obama administration objected to it any, as well and got the same treatment. Words are important, phrases are important. What's your take on all of that? Well, to, to take up what you started with, I dislike the expression, the media. And when I'm talking about sort of the legitimate news media, I'll often use the term the press, even though it's outdated in some ways, but I think it helps us understand what we're talking about. Uh, when we do say the media, who knows what that is? It could be everything from Breitbart to the National Enquirer to Fox News to the New York Times and a million others. It's an almost meaningless expression. Um, so I don't like that. And I don't like the expression fake news either because although it actually does mean something, which is a story, stories that have been sort of drummed up, uh, they're intended to be false, and they usually have a political or sometimes a monetary purpose. They aren't news. There's something that looks like news that's false. But I, I think that that phrase, fake news, has now been, I guess what we say is weaponized. It's, it's used now when, you know, we see anything we don't like, or the president sees anything he doesn't like, or any politician sees anything he doesn't like, that's fake news. In fact, people can even be your fake news. So I think it's, it's I'd rather call it something else. I'd rather say a false news story, a conspiracy theory, a hoax, whatever it may be to try to be more specific. I, I think it's one of those expressions that came blazing into our lives and almost immediately became pointless. Trump care? You know, I guess if it's fair to call the, although Obama really, it was his program. I mean, it was it was the thing that he wanted to build his legacy on. I don't know. I haven't really thought about Trump care, but I do. I agree with you that words are very important, uh, and I think that Obama ended up sort of embracing the. the he said that for a while. Yeah. He said it with <laughs> conviction and. Yeah. It didn't exactly play out the way That's he intended. True. That's true. Does anybody have a question? Just raise your hand. Thank you. In the back. Hi. Hi there. Hi. Um, you had, oh, I'm Alana Altler. I'm local TV reporter here. You had alluded before to the idea that the local media had played a part uh, in the disintegration of the local media, had played a part in misunderstanding the rise of Donald Trump. What would you suggest that the local media can do in the future in order to bender, better understand our viewers and our readers? Well, I think that local media, uh, it's, I, I'm not faulting the local news media. Uh, what I'm worried about is that local journalism is becoming weaker because of the economic model that's disintegrating. Um, certainly newspapers are struggling and that's not going to get any better. And so when, you know, so I, I, I don't say, I, here's a program and this is a way I think that local media can improve itself. It, I don't see it that way at all. I, I'm worried about the business model that underlies it. Um, speaking of local media, after the election, the Washington Post did a lot of high-profile hiring, um, including, I think, something like 20 video positions. Why not instead have a number of bureaus throughout the country to actually cover those flyover states? Well, uh, And I mean, that's not yeah. just for the Post, but for the, the Times has slashed their bureaus, mm -hmm. as have other big papers that have resources, <clears throat> unlike small papers here. So yeah, I, I mean the the post is actually has set up something called the America Desk and they are uh, doing a pretty good job of beefing up uh, coverage throughout the country as a as a response in part as a response to uh, what happened during the election. So uh, as far as the the video um, hiring goes, this is you know, again, this is newspaper company trying to make sure it has a solid business model, and video is one of the ways that newspaper companies online can make money. 
So, I mean, I, I think every editor would say, and it can be good journalism too, you know, <laughs> it's really important in that way. But I think that the underlying uh, driving force is that it's a way to beef up the bottom line. Other questions? I stole the microphone. Um, I'm Grace from Chalkbeat, and I was wondering, uh, after having... I love Chalkbeat. Oh, that's great. <laughs> after having a few years to really have time to think about media in a way you probably didn't when you were in the newsroom in Buffalo, if you had to write something, if you could go, had to go back to the newsroom and had to write something on a post-it note about reporting and editing, what would it be after these years of really digging deep? Mm. Wow. On a post-it note, a big post-it note. <laughs> it could be uh, a big one. <laughs> I mean, I, I actually think that what I would say is something I'd say to myself as editor, which is to uh, find, you know, I, I was always trying to do, make, make sure the whole paper was running well and was at a, a high level of quality. And I wonder sometimes whether an intense focus on one thing, a specialty, uh, something that you hammer away at, might be a better idea. Um, you know, you decide that the thing that you care about, the thing that your paper is going to care about is, for example, um, public education or inequality in public education. And, you know, actually, we did a lot with that in Buffalo and we did a lot with poverty coverage. but. Um, you know, to sort of find something that is really important and just truly own it. Yeah, hey, back here, I've got the mic, so I'll use it. Uh, yes. Bruce Perry, I teach here at Vanderbilt, faculty member. Hi. Thanks for coming to Nashville. Thank you. Um, you guys spoke earlier about anonymous sources, which I think is one of two kind of big contemporary issues confronting reporters in newsrooms these days from critics and watchdogs. The other is false, what we shorthand is false equivalence. Yeah. And so I, I kind of like to get you to talk a little bit about that, mm -hmm. this idea that um, on the news side, not talking the editorial pages, that on the news side, you're confronted with what you feel, what a newsroom feels is an obligation to treat an issue as having kind of balanced legitimacy on both sides, climate change is the one that especially comes to mind, but it, there are so many issues it applies to. I think uh, news organizations are more aware of it now than they have been, uh, you know, more aware, increasingly aware of it. There was a time when objectivity meant that you did this sort of, well, he said, she said, right? Uh, you know, some say the earth is flat, others insist that it is round, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and what has to happen in, in cases like that is reporters and editors need to be comfortable asserting uh, established truth or reasonably well-established truth. So, you know, if you have a climate change denier uh, or a bunch of them, you should be able to say in your own voice, uh, you know, scientific evidence largely supports or almost exclusively supports such and such. I think, so that's sort of the he said, she said part of it. The bigger question with false equivalency, and this came up again during the campaign, where certainly from the left, people felt, uh, and I think reasonably so, that there was so much being written about Trump and his foibles, his, you know, his bankruptcies, his, his thing, outrageous thing of the day, uh, whatever it was, that, well, if we're going to be fair, we ought to have just as much about his opposition, his competitor. And so the main thing that there was to focus on there was the email scandal. And so the email scandal got sort of, I mean, Reasonable people can disagree on this, um, but you know, did we build up the email scandal in order to meet, in order to present an equivalency with all the things that were going on with Trump? And so it's, I mean, it's something to be acutely aware of. I don't think there's sort of a handbook to answer it, but you're right, it's, it's one of the big issues. You got a question up here, did you? 
Anybody else? Uh, Boyd Brown, resident. Res I'm very curious about your viewpoints now on how to approach the Electoral College after the events of this election. Well, I'm not a political reporter, uh, and I, I, I think I'm going to have to punt on that because I don't, I, I don't really have. Look, I'd like to see. I mean, if it were up to me right now and I had to change the system or not change it, I think I would say yes, it should, it should be one person, one vote. The popular vote is the vote. I know there's an argument on the other side, um, but it's kind of a little outside my wheelhouse, to be honest. Yes, uh, David Plaza from the Tennessee, and uh, thank you for being here. And my question is, since Trump was elected and since his inauguration, we hear a lot more the press lies, the press is not credible. What are, is your approach to addressing news literacy, uh, especially for people who don't read us and really don't want to read us, yet the information we get is, is, is what is, is, it takes a long time to get to it. And also, how do you explain the kind of process that you do to get there? Is it worthwhile explaining how you source and, and why you source the way you do? So, I, I mean, I think a lot of good things have happened in recent months. Um, one is that I think people who care deeply about the truth, and this, this, isn't, this isn't political, although it sounds like it is. People who care deeply about the truth, um, you know, are supporting news literacy organizations. They're supporting, um, they're supporting newspapers. I hope they're supporting their hometown newspaper um, as much as I know that they're supporting national newspapers. Um, and I think that an emphasis on civics in the classroom, I mean, maybe we can call it something that sounds a little less 1960s-ish, but we have, to, we have to do a better job of helping young people understand you know, what the democracy is all about, how to read, how to understand what is and isn't true, and how, you know how to come at news through a critical lens, and I am seeing much more of that, and I find it encouraging. I, I want to interject here briefly that um, one of the challenges facing the press is that people tend to look at MSNBC and Fox and reach conclusions about the media, and and forget about local journalism and the high quality of work being done there. And David Plazas is sort of, I think he's a creation of the Newspaper Association of America. I'm pretty sure the Disney company has, has created David. <laughs> this is a man who rides the bus to meet readers. And uh, the Tennesseans blessed to have him. And it's, it's, it is the best of local journalism. So you can get a subscription to the Tennessean, by the way, for as little as $10 or $20. And David can eat, so I encourage you to do that, <laughs> please. Uh, do we have another question right here? Yeah, I noticed, um, I'm Susan Mine, I'm part of the Vanderbilt community. Um, I noticed that the Post has recently adopted the slogan, democracy dies in darkness. Yes. And um, I, obviously a very intentional statement about the role of the press at this moment in time, but also kind of curious, what went into developing that um, and how, whether or not that was something that many in the newsroom participated in the conversation and how it's playing in the newsroom and how it's playing outside in, amongst the readers. Well, there was a process of, of several months, if not more, in which um, a number of people were asked to suggest, um, you know, new ways the paper, you know, a, a slogan or a motto. Um, there seemed to be, you know, a lot of emphasis on wanting to talk about democracy and, and shedding light. And as it happened, um, the phrase, something close to democracy dies in darkness, is something that um, Bob Woodward uh, of Watergate fame had said at a number of different times. It kind of was in the tradition at the Washington Post. I don't know exactly how it you know, how it rose to the surface. But, I mean, I think that it it speaks to what the paper is trying to do. And at the same time, I think there has been a little bit of, um, it is, it does have a kind of a, um, a dire feel to it. Um, and, and, you know, Slate Magazine did a, a very funny uh, piece about, you know, something like 10 heavy metal albums that 
have a more cheerful uh, <laughs> have a more cheerful title than the Washington Post new slogan. But I think it's effective. It gets the point across. It's kind of cool. I'm seeing it on T-shirts, and um, I think it's gone over pretty well in the newsroom. You know, a little bit of a little bit of uh, self uh, mocking laughter about it. But in general, I think people are behind it. Snark in a newsroom. A little snark. I can't believe it. A little bit. Deborah, uh, we've got time for two more questions. Hi, I'm Mariah Timms. I write for Small Town Weekly outside of Nashville. Um, my question is mostly about your view on your career and how, if your your view as your role, wow, your view of your role as a journalist has changed as you've been a writer, an editor, and now a columnist. Yeah, I mean, the thing that's changed, I think, and and I I say this with a certain amount of regret, is that when I came into journalism, and it was in the '80s, um, I thought it was the coolest possible thing to do, and I was so proud to tell people what I did and so idealistic about it and I also thought that just the newsroom culture was just the greatest thing. I loved the 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 slang that we used. I loved the stories about, you know, the crotchety old editor. All of that, the sort of the whole romance of it really appealed to me. And I came into journalism uh, as a high school journalist because of Watergate, because of Woodward and Bernstein. You know, what's happened in recent months with the disparagement of the press, not just by the president and his administration, but by many people who follow him and listen to him, uh, is really, it's heartbreaking. Um, and while, you know, I'm not shedding any active tears over it, I I, I feel very bad that that the reputation of journalists has declined in our society so much. And we know that this is true. Trust levels are very low. And now all of this business about fake news, I mean, you'd be shocked if you saw the email I get from, you know, if, if I write a tough piece, uh, the, it's, it's horrible. Um, it's actually pretty abusive. And that's just nothing I ever anticipated. And it's, um, it's hard to take. I, that really resonates, and uh, we have time for one more question, but I, want, I would just want to say that um, I've been an educator, and I've been a lawyer, and I've been a journalist. Journalistic ethics stands with the best of them. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the most idealistic, squeaky clean profession I've ever been part of. You got one more question? Time for one more question. Hi, I'm Dave Boucher. I'm a reporter with the Tennessean. Um, and you kind of addressed this a little bit with uh, per uh, Professor Barry's question, but can you talk a little bit about um, the role of, of fact checking uh, with uh, not only within the organization, uh, but also just like on, on the beat reporter level? Uh, it's kind of a uh, you know, a vogue thing with, with entire organizations devoted to fact checking, but how a reporter can do a better job of that day in, day out, or whether, whether to just like let a clearly blatantly false statement from a prolific speaker in your area just you know don't swing at it what what you're supposed to do right yeah I mean I think it's tricky and and you know it's great for papers and organizations that have full fact-checking departments great but what if you're you know covering the police beat and your you know your main news source wants to say something on the record that's blatantly false you know how do how do you handle that and you know I do think <laughs> we have to push very hard for the truth and in whatever way we can so to to go back to that person and present the facts as you see them uh to get someone to counter it to bring up some evidence in the story um i mean i think there are a lot of different ways to do it but i think it's become more important than ever that we sort of make it clear to our readers that we've kind of got their backs when it comes to truth. And, um, you know, the days of, of complete, down the middle, uh, old school objectivity, I think are uh, somewhat numbered. I, I believe in fairness, I believe in impartiality, but I don't believe in letting people just say things because they can. Deborah, um 
This gentleman's very patient. Let's get. Let's let, let him have have. It's. It better be a really good question, though. <laughs> I'm sure, it will be. The pressure's on. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, my name is Don Morady, and and I do appreciate you you calling on me. And I believe it is a, a good question because I think it cuts to everything that we've been talking about tonight. And that is what you just said about how heartbreaking it is to listen to what's happened. And my question is. What is the news media as a whole doing about it? I, I've seen individual um, companies and papers coming out with their own expressions or whatever to kind of push back against this. But it, it, it seems to me that we may be at a tipping point where four years from now, we're going to be talking about what happened to the news media. Mm -hmm. And it, it may be a sci-fi kind of, you know, looking at sci-fi, it may just be bumpy four years. But what is or should the news media as a whole uh, doing about what's going on right now? Yeah, you know, it's a, we're, we're a funny industry because we're co very competitive with each other and we're not much about joining uh, we like to give awards, but we don't necessarily like to uh, join up and get behind each other and, and back each other up all the time. I mean, you will see in a lawsuit, for example, you'll see, you know, a long list of, of news media companies joining in uh, to support something. I, I think we have to do more of that. I think we've got to get together a little bit more and, um, and tell our story better and also not be afraid to advocate for press rights. I mean, we're very, very uncomfortable as an industry advocating in any way because we don't see that as, as what we're supposed to do. You know, we're supposed to just deliver the news and stay out of it. But if we do not advocate for, uh, for freedom of the press, I don't know who's going to do it, so I think we must. Thank you. Thank, Th thank those you. are great questions. I, I, I've saved one more question, the most hard-hitting question of the <laughs> evening, so brace yourself. So what do you think of Mary Tyler Moore? Oh, I, I uh, <laughs> you know, it's not true I've only been writing about Trump because I did write about Mary Tyler Moore. That's the column I'm referring and to. And I, I, you know, I found that as a uh, young woman, it was pretty inspiring to see, uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't remember thinking like, oh, I want to be that. But I think it was one of the first shows that depicted a woman, uh, a professional woman, um, in that particular way. That it was fun. You could throw your hat in the air. You know, it was uh, it was a way of being that we hadn't really seen before. And she was a journalist, a TV journalist, uh, and and you know, it was all it was all in fun. But I think it there was a larger message, especially for young women there that was really powerful. So oddly, I would say my inspirations, in addition to Woodward and Bernstein, would have to include Mary Richards. And, and you know, Mary Richards was a familiar person, even though we worked in newspapers, but there was always a Ted. Absolutely. There was always a Murray. Absolutely. I mean, it, it was so, it was so it real. It was all very familiar. And uh, I will tell you that in the, in the early aughts, I uh, tried to organize an event at the Associated Press Managing Editors Convention, I really wanted Mary Tyler Moore to come and talk to the editors about being Mary Richards. Yes. Couldn't get Mary. I got, I got Lou. Oh, so, Lou. So, so Ed Asner. Asner showed up, and he was so excited about meeting journalists who all would come up and shake his hand and hug him. It was, he was a patron saint of city editors, and he was the most popular man I'd ever seen at a newspaper convention. <laughs> and the last time I saw Lou, Lou Grant, I will call him that, he was leading the conga line at the Hard Rock Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Lou Grant was everything we ever wanted to be. That's fantastic. Um, please join me in thanking Margaret Sullivan. Thank you.